this afternoon. All right. So there's nothing like a little bit of a spanner in your panel works uh, this afternoon. We've, we've gone impromptu. I've gone rogue. Um, we have had, we have had uh, for your program anyway, we've had uh, the first three Wahine tour, unfortunately unable to make it today for various reasons. Uh, so we've got a little bit of a jiggle with our lineup. Um, but I'm still here. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the most knowledgeable person in the room on all of this sort of stuff, but entertaining nonetheless, right? So. First and foremost, I'm going to call to our stage our speakers. Hey, it does mean, that, by the way, that we've now got our speakers in the room because we were going to be Zooming in um, a couple of people, so it's a little bit nicer and warmer and friendlier, so get your questions ready. We are going to bring to the stage Tane Watford, Lead Advisor at, at MFAT. Um, now, Tane, where are, you? where are you? Please come on up. Tane is going to be our first speaker, and he's waddling over very slowly. Come on, come on. Uh, Tane has a Master in Law from Victoria University. Uh, he is Whanaunga to the Honourable Minister. Uh, I will let, you tell, I'll let him tell you that story. He also has, over a decade, being 14 years of experience in all sorts of wonderful policy roles at uh, the Ministry, and he's going to be joining us this afternoon as our first speaker. You want to, you want to come and sit first? Come and sit, come and sit, take a seat. Our second gentleman, we're over here, there he is. You've already heard from them this afternoon, so you probably know more about him than I possibly could rattle off in a few minutes, but I will introduce him um, just before he speaks. Jason Meeker is coming to the stage for a little bit of a keynote uh, on some fantastic topics. Uh, and then we're gonna go to a video, and then we're gonna unpack all that with you involved in some questions and answers with these two lovely gentlemen. Don't ask me anything on, on what they're about to talk about, no. We're gonna have some fun, all right, guys? We're good to go. Tane, do you want to come to the podium or would you like to stay there, my friend? He's now my friend, did you hear that? <laughs> just like, just like, really. you can come here? Yeah, okay. Tēnā tātou katoa, uh, tuatahi Anita Miki ki a koutou katoa, uh, pai marere uh, ki a koutou ko tai ki te wā. Uh, kia ora, uh, that's when you go. Okay, so that was the practice run, so kia ora. Ah, oh, nice. Um, Firstly, I do want to mihi to um, uh, my whanaunga, taku whanaunga, uh, itaminita uh, e rino. Um, <coughs> so his maternal grandfather is my grandmother's brother. <coughs> and so on, on kazi, kaz. <laughs> so on our ngawati, ngati hine, um, whakapapa, we, we're very closely um, connected and I'm very proud of um, his appointment as, as, as Minister. <coughs> Kia ora. Um, can I also secondly acknowledge um, those of our, our diplomatic colleagues in the room? Uh, we've heard from big, uh, uh, our, uh, our new uh, UK um, Consul General, uh, Deputy Consul General from Japan, and, and also well, she stepped out of the room, but uh, Deputy High Commissioner, uh, Deputy Head of Mission for the Australian High Commission. Um, it's good to have you here. I'm really glad that uh, Trina has said we're going rogue. I'm very mindful that uh, you've been doing a lot of listening, and uh, and I've been coming up with a cunning plan on how to change that. <clears throat> so here we are at the Auckland Trade and Economic Policy School. Uh, we've been talking a lot about trade and economics policy. I want to put the school into it. So welcome to school. Uh, and what do we do in the classroom? We share ideas. Heard this morning a comment, I'm not asking you to tell me how to do my job. I'm opposite. I am asking you to tell me how to do my job. And so I'm going to put some questions to you and you're going to do some work. It's not right that I'm up here and that we're up here doing all the mahi uh, with all of the bright minds in the room. Um, I do particularly want to acknowledge the MFAT graduate cohort. 
and I know you've got lots of bright ideas and you're going to be sharing them. Um, you have been warned. <clears throat> um, before doing so, though, um, this conference is supposed to have a trans-Tasman Australia-New Zealand flavour, right? And so I do want to focus my comments on, uh, on that trans-Tasman relationship, in particular Aboriginal First Nations and Māori. I won't be giving uh, a report card on what MFAT has done in this space. You can look it up for yourselves. Um, but I do want to acknowledge uh, the important relationships and the opportunities we have here um, to build um, indigenous to indigenous trade uh, with indigenous trade. <clears throat> I had the uh, privilege of going to Sydney last year for the ANZLF, uh, participating partly in the uh, indigenous sector business group. I do want to acknowledge our speakers who are not able to attend today, Tracy Hopapa, who is the New Zealand co-chair for that group, and also uh, the newly appointed Michelle Deschamps, uh, who is the Australian co-chair of that group. I sat at the same table as Michelle, she's a wonderful woman, and I do look forward to what she, uh, with Tracy, uh, the energy and the thoughts that they will bring to that mahi. <clears throat> Last year, they decided on two priorities, uh, strengthening MSMEs and strengthening women in trade. Modi order, choice. After Sydney, I went on to Melbourne for an Indigenous First Nations business forum and heard some really cool kōrero. Uh, there are some awesome things being talked about and being done in Australia. Please allow me to share an, uh, a couple of things. We heard from one Aboriginal business leader who talked about the concept of dungai. And uh, he explained that to mean uh, as part of the environment, when you breathe out, the environment around you breathes in. Likewise, when the environment around you breathes out, you breathe in. So there's the sense of harmonization. And what he said in relation to uh, the economic environment is that it is choking us. Uh, the economic environment is not breathing in harmony um, with uh, indigenous economies. Question one for you. We'll come back to that later. Um, we heard some also, also some other cool corridor coming out of Australia. Um, some ideas around uh, fishing partnerships, and uh, you're familiar with um, uh, fish farms. In Australia, they consider that putting their fish in prison. Isn't that an interesting concept? So what are the other concepts that indigenous peoples can bring um, when it comes to trade, well-being, uh, intergenerational uh, wealth? Perhaps another question for you. Australia is doing some cool stuff around social procurement, and there are some lessons that we can learn there. So, going rogue, um, I'm now going to invite a little bit of a little bit of speed dating, and. I'm going to give each table one minute to have a quick conversation and come up with one idea around how to strengthen uh, Māori and Indigenous uh, economies. What is, what is the one thing that your table can do? One minute, go. Thank you, uh, Tane. Um, and where is that young lady? About capability. I'll come and see you later too. Business capability, number one. It's the priority if we're talking about growth, right? In terms of business. Ella, you're on my friend list. 
Alrighty, our next speaker, let me do some more introductions. Jason Mika is tūhoi, Ngāti Aoa, Whakatohia and Ngāti Kahanunu, possibly Whanonga, I could be claiming you too. Born in Whakatane and raised mainly in uh, Rotorua. Uh, Jason's married and is a Holy hecka, a very brave man with seven children. Yay to you. Uh, he is an associate professor at Te, Raup uh, Te Raupapa uh, Waikato Management School and Te Kotahi Research Institute at the University of Waikato. Jason's work centres on indigenous business philosophy and he completed his PhD in Māori entrepreneurship. Amongst many other academic and consultancy roles specialising in Māori economic development, he has influenced in several areas of public policy. He is super bright. That's what you want in your intro, right? He's super bright, a great speaker. And for those reasons alone, I actually will now claim him as Whanonga. Please give him a warm welcome, Jason Mika. Wow, oh my goodness. Okay, um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's just a, a pleasure for me to, uh, to be uh, at the podium again. I uh, just want to thank uh, you to the Minister, Moana Kōrero, Moana Kauhau ki a tātou ki te kitakia ki te nei kaupapa, hei oranga. Uh, well, uh, far out. Um, now, I just wanted to say that um, my, what I'm going to talk about is Indigenous trade. And um, my interest in Indigenous trade started on a bus. It started on a bus in 1997. Uh, my boss was uh, Tatari White, who was the, he was the uh, regional manager at Tapuni Kōkiri. And uh, he went over to Canada and uh, met up with some Canadian First Nations people. And they were so fascinated by, uh, you know, te ao Māori, uh, they wanted to come over. So uh, they brought a busload of them over. Well, they came on a plane first, obviously, but when they got here, they jumped on a bus. And I uh, says, uh, oh, boss, can I come? And he says, yeah, come. So I was the, uh, the policy analyst. This is 1997, mind you, you know. Uh, so back in the day... Uh, and it was just fascinating. So I spent uh, a week on the bus with uh, these Canadian First Nations uh, business people, uh, with Māori entrepreneurs, and uh, we started in Tāmaki Makaurau and went down towards, uh, towards the south uh, and stopped off at different places, uh, Waikato Tainui, Rotorua, Taupo, uh, and a few other places as well. And what, uh, what I guess, brought them together was that that whanaungatanga, the minister was talking about, that sort of sense of connectivity, our relationships with one another, our common aspirations for the well-being, for the betterment of our people. Uh, and that sort of brought us together. Now, that was the sort of concept of inter-Indigenous trade, trade between Indigenous peoples, and it was sort of starting out that way. Now, the thing that really brought it together was that, that sort of cultural empathy with one another. But at the same time, these were business people. They were looking for commercial opportunity as well. So they had this really interesting tension going on between sort of, yes, honouring their, uh, their tipuna, their ancestors, uh, but also honouring uh, those of uh, present generations who are looking for their sort of commercial opportunity, uh, but providing also for the future. And that pretty much sums up the, uh, the challenge of Indigenous business. How do you do that? How do you sort of provide for those commercial and cultural imperatives that drive indigenous business people to do what it is that they do, not only here in Aotearoa, but across the world? And so <clears throat> that was my introduction into, into indigenous trade. Now, one of the questions that, uh, that uh, you know, because of my interest in this area is, uh, the first question I get asked is, what is it? What is indigenous trade? And, uh, you know, OECD is trying to figure it out. Uh, world, you know, world, other sort of agencies um, are trying to, we're trying to figure it out. And so, uh, and I was just having lunch with a colleague here, just so I just met over lunch. He, the first question, what is it, Jason? And so um, I'm just going to give my view of what it is so that we can get that out of the road. 
And basically what it is for me is uh, people, indigenous people who identify as being indigenous, uh, who wish to do business uh, with each other and with the rest of the world in indigenous ways. Uh, so um, it's indigenous people doing trade for indigenous purposes all around the world. Uh, and <clears throat> now, that's the first bit. That gets us started. So identity is really important in terms of, in terms of indigenous trade. But when you're thinking about, well, okay, what, what, what's beyond that? There's basically four key dimensions. You know, being an academic, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a bit of schooling like the brother over here, but basically there's four key dimensions. One is indigenous entrepreneurs. So you've got entrepreneurs who identify as being indigenous people, whether they're Māori, uh, Aboriginal, First Nation, uh, and Sami, and, uh, and Pacific Island. So they identify as being indigenous people, and they want to do business in indigenous ways. Second element, indigenous firms. So who are the indigenous firms? We are the Māori enterprises, uh, and we are the Aboriginal enterprises. How do we know what one looks like when we're looking at it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it do? How does it behave? How do we count them to make sure that they count? Uh, so that's the second dimension uh, for indigenous uh, trade and enterprise. The third dimension is indigenous economies. Now, I heard that, uh, that uh, word... Uh, sort of bandied around uh, today. So we want to, you know, uh, sort of support indigenous economies through trade. What is an indigenous economy? How do we measure that? How do we engage with it? Now we have a thing called the Māori economy, which uh, Dr. Ganesh Nana and his mates at Burl and others have been sort of uh, telling us, kind of, it looks kind of like this and it does this and here's some firms. What more? And how, do we, how does an indigenous economy look in Australia? Canada, North America, uh, and parts of Europe, Asia, and so forth? And how do we engage with them? The fourth dimension is indigenous development. You know, why do indigenous firms engage in business and trade? For their whanau, for their families, for their communities, uh, for their betterment. And so there needs to be a connection between trade and well-being of whanau, and whenua, and, you know, rangi and papa. So, uh, there, that has to be the fourth dimension. So it gets complicated, doesn't it? You know, you have to show the connections between free trade agreements, trade policy, trade facilitation, and actual trade, uh, and, and how that sort of affects uh, and benefits whānau, actual people. So that's all I'm going to say on the definition of Indigenous trade, but, you know, it's work in progress, and uh, welcome all your fellas' uh, ideas on that. The other thing that I wanted to speak on just briefly is that um, I was very blessed to uh, be asked to help out with the New Zealand and United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement. Now, uh, Chrissy, she's just left with the minister, Chrissy Grace. Chrissy Grace, uh, we, she rang me up and said, Jace, we, we need a bit of help here. Uh, we need to get the, what did the Māori enterprises think about this United Kingdom, you know, well, let's New Zealand, United Kingdom, free trade agreement. What do they think about that? He says, uh, can you help us out? And I said, yep. So we started a project. And we talked to 50 Māori enterprises. 50. You know, so their views, what we wanted to do is to sort of say, well, what do you think about this? Is it good? Is it bad? How do you want to engage with it? How do you want to benefit from it? So we captured their views and made that available to the negotiating team. And they were able to, well, look what happened. You know, uh, we, we got a deal. Uh, there's, a, there's a Māori uh, trade and uh, economic cooperation trapped in there. There's all sorts of stuff in there, as the minister's pointed out. Uh, and some of the key things in there is pretty much what you all came up with uh, from our teacher here. You know, capacity building. Māori enterprises want, you know, and need the capacity to be able to trade internationally. So what does that look like and how do we support them to do that? Uh, and Indigenous-led trade missions is, is another key aspect as well, but also the right and ability to be at the table. You know, they want to be at the negotiating table in the room, sitting next to Tane, you know, giving their view on what's good, what's not in this deal that's unfolding. Uh, so they want to be at the, the economic 
table uh, alongside the Crown. The other key thing is, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, with, with that is, well, um, it's, it's great that, you know, that, it, it, that the trade chapter is in there for the, for the Māori trade chapter is in there. But uh, a lot of them were thinking, well, who's the indigenous people in the uh, United Kingdom? Who are we doing business with? Well, doing business with the, the United Kingdom uh, customer over there. And, uh, and, and whether or not they want to consume Māori uh, and indigenous products and services. Uh, so, I mean, that was a real uh, privilege there. Now, the, now, that was a deal and a, a process that was really of interest to the Māori, uh, the Māori enterprises. Now, I got another call up. Now, someone else called me. Uh, Tane called me up and he says, oh, Jace, we've got this other little job for you. Uh, you want to help us out? We've got, we've got this thing. We had this APEC and uh, APEC was good, you know, you know, a lot of meetings and a lot of stuff happened. Uh, but we need to evaluate this APEC thing that we did uh, and use the Treaty of Waitangi as a framework to evaluate it. And let's call that a treaty audit of how well we did on APEC. And so, can you do that, Jason? I said, I'll give it a go. So I did. Uh, and uh, fascinating. Now, the beautiful thing about... Now, I was interviewed by... Uh, anyone heard of Ngātuki Whakarudolanga? Yeah, Ngātuki. So we were going to have Moana. Uh, so, you know, we're really keen to meet Moana. You know, just celebrity, you know. It's just amazing. She's amazing. So, uh, but never mind, another time. Now, anyway, she's the co-convener of Ngātuki along with Peter Tsipene. Now, Peter interviewed me and he says straight out you know he's asking me about the job you know what's your position on the Treaty of Waitangi uh, Jason and I told him straight out what it was and he goes mm, okay yeah okay I think we can do business and I said oh thank you uh, you know but you know and what I what I learned from that whole experience is that Ngātuki Whakarururanga is all about holding the line uh, for Māori, in terms of Māori, indigenous rights and responsibilities and aspirations. Because as the tribunal, as the Waitangi tribunal keeps telling us, you know, um, winning the crown over is not an easy business. You know, when you're trying to do business with the crown, it's tough. And sometimes we have to go to the tribunal to straighten things out a bit and tell us what's what. Now, Ngātuki have a treaty framework that is really based on their view of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. That says that Māori do have tino ranga tiritanga. They have that aspiration. They have that right. They have that responsibility. To, and why do they have that? To look after their whānau, their hapu, their iwi, and make sure that they have the best lives possible in Aotearoa. Simple as that. That's why that exists, and they recognise that. So... Uh, and uh, uh, your, your fellow's boss down the end there, he's had lots of interesting conversations with them through APEC to figure out, well, okay, this is the Crown's view of the Treaty of Waitangi, and uh, this is the Māori vision of the Treaty of Waitangi. How can we do business? Well, that took about six months of kōrero, uh, which was pretty quick, really, um, but they got there in the end. So, you know, we've got to agree on what are the principles. So that group... And really, it, it sort of taught me something about the treaty. It taught me that, you know, it's, it's a way of setting out the nature of our relationships together between Māori and the Crown and how we can work together. And whether you want to call that co-governance or whatever you want to call it, it's a way of working together so that we can get the very best for our people, you know. And that's what it was about. And so that's something that I learned from that experience. So uh, now I just wanted to um, basically just uh, end on um, being a researcher, being a, a, a researcher. I just, you know, I've got some questions I want answers to. And I hope that you want these questions answered too. Number one, what is indigenous trade? What is it really? Uh, so what's the definition? What's your definition? What's my definition? What is... Australia's definition, OECD, uh, United Nations, WTO, what, is the, what does indigenous trade actually mean, really? Number two, how do we measure it? 
How do we measure? How do we measure indigenous trade? Either the flows of indigenous goods and services, the indigenous businesses that do business with one another, whether that's goods, services, or digital trade, or something else, or exchanges. So the measurement, the economics, how do we get from sort of measuring the value of indigenous trade and its contribution to indigenous well-being? How do we get there? That's the second question. The third question is, how do we enable indigenous enterprises to do indigenous trade using indigenous knowledge, values, and preferences? In other words, mātauranga Māori and indigenous and traditional knowledge. How do we do that? And so uh, do we leave that to the New Zealand trade and enterprise folk, you know, Tina Wilson and Jeremy Gardner and all our whanaunga over there? Or do we, uh, you know, what do we do? So those are the three big questions that I want answers to. Uh, and we're working on, on that. Uh, that's why I've got to go home tonight and write, write that up and what, what that looks like. But thank you for your ideas. I took notes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll credit this whole conference <laughs> as the source of the inspiration for those ideas. So I uh, just want to leave it there. Kia ora. There's some thought starters for you. Were you wanting to unpack some of their kōrero and whakaaro on those questions now? Do you want to do? You wanna do, do you wanna, we, can, we can break this up a little bit. I'm going rogue again. I'm looking and I'm not getting told off. So let's do this. Um, okay, so there's some microphones in the room. You've heard both of our, uh, our tāne talk on, on various things, but very similar things. We've had a few things come in from the audience already. Let's unpack what those three points were uh, for Jason. So we can do his homework for him if you want. You've got some very smart looking people here. Um, so why don't we do that? So has anyone got any thoughts or ideas on what indigenous trade is? What is it? What does it mean for you? What does it look like? Anything. Be brave. Kia maya, kia manawanui, kia kaha. Guided by tikanga, guided by tikanga, absolutely, always. What else? Yeah. Huh? Responsive to. F <sighs> He's writing. He's writing. I. Trade by self-identified indigenous peoples. Come with that. Come with a bit more. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely, always, right? And I would imagine uh, most of those values would align pretty closely with Indigenous people. Actually, I was at a dinner last night with Secretary Deb, Deb Harland out of the US, first Native American woman uh, in the US Senate, and that was one of her, her kaupapa. It's a big one uh, for her, particularly where I'm woman, an Indigenous woman helping Indigenous women. Uh, and I see a lot of women going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a big one. What else have we got? Come on, come on. Can't all be falling asleep. Yes. Oh, yeah. Not necessarily defined by bottom line profit. Okay, bye. All right. Yep, so it's not always about the money, ne? Not always about the money. Anyone else? No. No. Jace, what was your second one? How do we measure it? Particularly if it's not about money. Hey, like how do you measure it? I'll come to you first. Any ideas? No, you were just stretching. <laughs> yeah. No? No? By the benefits that it brings the community. There it is. Let me let me plant it actually. Yep. Sorry. Yes. Aye. So let me throw this statistic out for some thought and consideration. If every Māori business, because we know Māori employ, uh, ten, tend to employ Māori before anything else, right? Māori employ Māori. If every Māori business in New Zealand, and there's about 61,000 of them, there's a stat for you, if every one of them employed three more Māori people, we would completely flip the social outcomes of inequity in this country for Māori. That's all it would take three more humans employed in roles paying really good salaries, and I'm talking average salary there, we would completely flip 
in pay poverty, housing overcrowding, dependency on our prison systems, our hospitals, uh, and everything else that those nasty stats get thrown up in the news and the media all the time about Māori are the top of this and the worst inc incarceration rates and all that sort of stuff. If every Māori business employed three, there's, there's, there's the answer to your, uh, your stats there. The current cyclones on mental health and well-being, how our people are faring down in uh, Ngāti Kahununu and in Taitukuro at the moment, uh, and Taitāwhiti, mental health, climate change plays a big part in that. Sorry, stole the show. Anything more on how does it look? How do we measure it? Kyle? Alrighty. Long term. Long term. Sustainable growth? Yep, yep, no, that's a thing, it is a thing. 500 year business plan. Nice, intergenerational, yeah. Third thing, Jason? What was your third? How do we enable indigenous trade? Oh, now I'll take notes. How do we enable indigenous growth? Trade missions? Yeah, how do we get those back up and going again? Make sure out of coming out of COVID, obviously there was a two-year hiatus on uh, on trade missions, unfortunately. But what do they look? Are they worthwhile? Yes, no. What do they look like? Where do we go? How do we make those happen? People in the room that can make those happen. My friend Rachel, my friend, see, my friend as well. Yep. What else have we got? Anything else? How do we enable? Yes. You're building a long-term partnership, you're building capacity, you're building sustainable relationships, and things that are further. So it's not just a one-off, it's got to be something with a bit of a bigger vision and partnering. Okay. Which somebody should fund? <laughs> somebody should fund, if you didn't hear the last few words there. Any other ideas? Yes. Ticker. 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah. I like you. You can be my best friend too now. Sorry, Tane, you're off. <laughs> a bit of a dream got in the capital context. I was reading this tribunal settlement at a couple of years. Ooh, kia ora to that. Wow. That's big. That's big. You speak up. Speak up. Should we go? Because that one's worthwhile listening to that one. Uh, I said a bit of a dream, but um, in a capital context, uh, revisit Waitangi tribunal settlements at the hapu level as opposed to iwi. All right. Do you want to, Do you guys want to talk to that a bit more so there's a bit more context to it, Jason Tane? Do you want to? Do you, no. Okay. No. Get the bike. Get the bike. Do you want to elaborate any more than that, just to give people in the room? Okay. All good. All good. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's okay. We can. It's, you've, Jason's got it, so he he gets it. Anyone else? Oh, oh, oh! Look, look! I love this. Hands are now popping up everywhere. Uh, at the back there. No, no. Hi. Hi. <laughs> got it. Um, had a bit of a chat about this yesterday with NZTE, and um, a really important thing that stuck with me was updating geographic indicators to protect not just intellectual property, but tikanga, the stories behind the names that we use and the regions that we want to protect. Nice. And actually that leads into the video that we're about to watch quite nicely as well, but first we'll, we'll take yours. Kia ora. Um, Kia ora. Targeted capacity building. So basic business skills, but also um, being able to leverage some of the opportunities in the digital economy yep. or, or services outside of some of those traditional sectors. Um, you know, it's very hard to export in some of those sectors, mm. and so there's a lot that could be done just to get people the first sort of rung on the ladder. Yeah. I, yeah, I could take you into my little back pocket with me when I leave. We should talk some more as well. Uh, alrighty. One more. We've got, oh, there we go. Kiora, inspired Kira. by access to finance, uh, looking at collective collateral and reform of uh, traditional systems about 
trade financing. Ooh. Yeah. You're right. You're keeping up there, Jace. <laughs> Scribbling away. Thank you. Alrighty, I think we are ready, unless there's anyone that's got anything, a little gold nugget somewhere else in there that, that we can write. Oh, there we go. I actually have a, sort of, a question. I've got no strong opinion on it, but we're talking about defining quality business. Um, and I just when we compared it to uh, digital trade today, that a really wide cast net, and it's basically anything digital, digital business. Is it in the interest of quality to have what looks to narrow down the definition we talked about having for? Four aspects um, people doing for um, in indigenous ways, um, you know, for a community by traditional practices. Could it be that actually having a really wide definition, um, anything um, already could be better for a trade strategy point of view? Do you want to take that one? Awesome question. Uh, oh, here, uh, yeah, very good question. So the the question there was uh, like. Uh, with the definition of Māori business and the wide definition of digital trade that we spoke about, heard about today, is it in the Māori interest to have that kind of a broad definition when we're dealing with Māori business? That kind of... Yeah, rather than narrowing it down to smaller groups of participants. Yeah. So my quick answer is yes. So with uh, Māori business, it's businesses that are uh, uh, where the, the owners identify as Māori so there's whakapapa in that business, uh, whakapapa Māori, uh, and those businesses then count. Uh, and what those businesses engage in and how they engage in digital trade is really the, the next bit. So how do we connect the two? And uh, for Māori businesses and for Māori entrepreneurs, uh, their interest in digital trade uh, you know, is just really wide open to them and they'll be looking for ways to engage in it, mm -hmm. but they'll also be concerned about protection, yeah. you know, which is the, the cultural imperative as well as the commercial element, and they want both. And that's the Ngātuki, the taumata tension there. You know, we went the commercial and the cultural imperatives are very important. Kia ora. Kia ora, Jace. Okay, and that leads us into our next session if there's no more um, thoughts on, on... Oh, yes. Small business traditionally, as we know, as we trade, come via the relationships with larger firms. Yeah. So that's got to be the first thing. Incentives and reducing those barriers, right? Enlightening. All righty. We are moving on. Uh, you would have heard Natoki mentioned a few times. You would have heard Moana Maniopoto's name mentioned a few times. Unfortunately, Moana can't be with us today um, as a very long-standing, very proud member of the Mūrawai community. Uh, Moana, unfortunately, and her and her neighbourhood have been quite devastated, as I'm sure you all, most of you will be aware, uh, by the recent floodings over anniversary weekend. Uh, her, her attention and her focus remains firmly in uh, re-standing her, her community up, and uh, we obviously send our loving thoughts to her at this time. Moana kanui ako aroha ki akoe o te ra ki katoa. In true form, however, because you would expect nothing less. Uh, we do have a very powerful video for you to watch uh, that has been pre-recorded. It is on the Ngātuki website. Uh, it's my pleasure to sort of just set a little bit of a scene first, even though you have heard a little bit about it, uh, before we push play. As a by Māori, of Māori, with Māori and for Māori body, Ngātuki Whakarururanga has and will continue to set the bar for trade policy and agreements that are consistent with Te Tiriti o Waitangi Ngātuki Whakarururanga will bring a new leadership model to every stage of the policy development process that reflects their mission statement, their kaupapa, which is mana whakahaere in the global domain is information by rangatira and kawangatana working together in a mana enhancing relationship of equals consistent with Te Tiriti o Waitangi and He Whakaputanga o Te Rangatira Tanga o Nu Te Reini. Okay, our closing presentation this afternoon, Man, uh, Moana Maniapoto e Ngā Tuki Whakarururanga. Please press play. Trade. Now, before you zone out, there's something you need to know. 
Trade isn't just about business people selling and buying stuff. The rules around trade can have a real and long-lasting impact on all of our lives and on the lives of our tamariki mukapuna. Because big trade agreements impact on decisions we want to make around the climate crisis, mining of our whenua and seabed, the health of our waterways, access to medicines and rongoa, preservation and protection of our culture, our taonga, mātauranga Māori. And when it comes to that digital space, that space we're always in, you need to know that tech companies can sell your data to advertisers who can then use it to target Māori with stuff like fast food or tobacco-related products. So when you think about it, even our whakapapa is exposed. Trade is everybody's business, but it is especially Māori business because we have te tiriti. You might ask why Māori haven't been actively and meaningfully involved every step of the way in making these rules. Some very onto it people have been asking that very same question for a very long time. In the early 1990s, the Y262 claim challenged the Crown over breaches of te tiriti at the World Trade Organisation. Well, there are a number of issues which came together, if you like. One was the historical taking and misuse of Māori taonga or treasures, whether it was the abuse of the tiki, whether it was the use of Māori faces on tourist tea towels or whatever. So there was that long historical issue. And in the 1980s, there were the more specific issues which had arisen largely in the context of multilateral trade agreements and the establishment of intellectual property regimes in the United Nations and the World Intellectual Property Organisation. Y262 was concerned about protecting plants and seeds. Like when Japan gene-banked varieties of kumara, we were kaitiaki over and a bunch of companies with no relationship to Māori started to sell products overseas that included kawakawa and manuka, making money out of mātauranga Māori. When Ngāti Awa tried to repatriate the mātātua wharenui, they were told it was an intellectual property issue. What is this thing, intellectual property, they wondered? So in 1993, they hosted the first global conference on cultural and intellectual property rights of indigenous people in Whakatane. Yep, Whakatane. And out of that came the Mātātua Declaration. Indigenous people said, we have the right and responsibility to control our own taonga. Laws with claws like parasites, devouring my human rights. Then heaps of Māori joined a global protest movement in the late 90s over the proposed Mai Multilateral Agreement on Investment. Mai was all about protecting the rights of foreign companies like those who bought forests on Māori land that were privatised without Māori consent. And massive mining companies ripping the heart out of the land. Global pressure was so big, the Mai was dropped. Some companies wanted our words. The names and images of other Indigenous people, say in the United States, have been exhausted. They've all been taken. So they look somewhere else and across the vast expanse of the Pacific, there's this whole range of primitive newness that has not yet been exploited in, in, in the current market environment. When I released my self-titled album into Europe, I was threatened with a lawsuit by a German company who had trademarked the name Wana. At the beginning of the tour, we got this fax coming through in our office from a lawyer from Cologne saying he's got the trademark for the name Moana. So he had trademarked it for toilet paper, for computers, for cosmetics, nearly everything you could think of. Then suddenly we got an email saying you can't use that name Moana, otherwise we will sue you. You have to pay quite a big fine of something like 100,000 euro. Companies were helping themselves to moko. And also to haka. Portraits of ancestors were plastered across shower curtains and sold online. There's nothing to stop them. You see, trade rules have not been about protecting mātauranga Māori. 
Back to now. How it works is that the Crown negotiates trade and investment agreements on behalf of all New Zealanders. At the moment, there is no formal system in place for Māori to fulfil our role as kaitiaki and rangatira. Many Māori have tried hard over the years to influence, to get involved, but they've been told most negotiations are too far down the track. Sorry, it's nearly signed off. Things need to be kept secret. Don't want other trade partners to get a whiff. The Crown can't push too hard to protect Māori things. The farmers will lose out. At least it's good for our Māori exporters. But trade isn't just about selling stuff. It's about protecting what was reaffirmed by Te Tiriti. And trade rules can restrict government policy and regulations to honour Te Tiriti. For example, when they started on the TPPA negotiations in 2010, a big issue for Māori was offshore mining by foreign mining companies. The same transnationals had been active in using trade and investment agreements to sue other governments over environmental policies that reduced their corporate profits and claimed hundreds of millions in compensation. The response to the nuclear phase-out is a case in point. Energy companies are not happy that Germany has opted to abandon nuclear energy, and so E.ON and RWE have launched legal proceedings at the German Federal Constitutional Court. If this wasn't enough, the Swedish company Vattenfall is appealing at a private ISDS arbitration tribunal, where it is demanding 3.7 billion euros in compensation. Corporations are suing to block a raising of the minimum wage, block health protection measures, overturn a ban on toxic waste dumping in a drinking water area. The same thing could happen here in Aotearoa if we bring about stricter climate policies or cancel permits for water bottling. So nine claimant groups ended up at the Waitangi Tribunal in 2015. To settle the claim, the trade unit within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade agreed in mediation to set up and fund a new entity called Ngātoki Whakarūruranga. It will have one job. Yep, just one, but it's a big one. To set the bar for trade policy and agreements to protect and advance any and all Māori rights, interests, duties and responsibilities under te tiriti and he whakaputanga that may be affected positively and negatively by trade policy and negotiation. Our mission is to have effective and genuine influence on trade negotiations every step of the way on behalf of Aotearoa because it's all about how we can bring a new leadership model to every stage of the process. Because remember, Māori aren't just stakeholders, we are tiriti partners. Trade isn't just about commercial benefits, it's about protection of our rights and taonga. It's going to be great for everyone, especially Tamariki Mokopuna. And that brings us to the end of the session this afternoon. You do have another session on. I think because we went rogue, we've used up more than our time allotment, maybe, possibly just a little smidgen. But that's all right. Uh, thank you. And your very wise words and your schooling of our audience. I'm not sure that's what you paid for. We no, you're here by guest invitation. Uh, thank you for letting me be here and have the privilege of leading these two fine gentlemen uh, in their corridor and obviously uh, Totoko to our minister as well. Uh, I think he may have moved on. Yes, he has. Uh, have a good afternoon, everybody. Enjoy your next session.